Good morning. It's good to be with you all. Uh, we are in the season of Lent, uh, the portion of the church calendar that leads up to Easter, the celebration of the resurrection. Uh, some of you are familiar with Lent. Some of you probably feel like it's a pretty foreign thing. Uh, it is a time uh, of, of reflection and preparation as we look ahead to celebrating the resurrection of Christ. I, re- I recommend you uh, look over the reflection and preparation uh, portion of your uh, order of worship at the front of your bulletin. If you didn't get a chance to uh, beforehand, maybe you can take it home and, and look at it. But this is, this is 40 days leading up to Easter. Those 40 days, if you're doing the math, do not include Sundays. Um, if you've ever wondered why it doesn't actually add up to 40. Uh, But it is, it's a a season of intentional reflection on why we need Christ's death and resurrection. It's a season of reflection on why the Holy Week, from Palm Sunday through Good Friday to Resurrection Sunday, why that was necessary, why we need that to be a reality. And it begins with Ash Wednesday, which was this past Wednesday. Um, And ash really is an appropriate symbol. It is a symbol both of death and of repentance. Uh, It is a symbol, it it reminds us of our mortality, and it reminds us of our spiritual condition outside of Jesus Christ. We walk through the the book. We will be walking through the the book of Habakkuk together on these Sundays through Lent. Habakkuk is an Old Testament prophet in the time of the exile. It really is a rich and precious book, crying out to God, asking Him how long, crying out in repentance and in need of redemption. Uh, so there is there's some somberness. There's some heaviness to the season of Lent. Uh, There will be some somberness and heaviness to uh, worship this morning because it is Lent. But it's also Sunday. Uh, It's the Lord's Day. It's the day of resurrection, and we will celebrate the Lord's Supper this morning. Uh, We will celebrate the fact that while we do mourn, while we do repent, while there are so many ways that we still do long to see Christ's redemption in our present reality, we ache for that. We, also, we do that knowing that Christ has defeated sin and death. We, we do this knowing that as Christ hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. And then he rose again in victory. And so it's Lent, but it's also Sunday. So let's stand together and hear as our God calls us to worship. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness none can fathom. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations through the Son, Jesus Christ. Come, let us worship.
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gracious invitation and call that you give to us to bring to you our prayers, to bring to you our praises, to bring to you our repentance and our mourning and our aching after redemption. And we do come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. We come to you on his merits and not our own. And we confess that we need your spirit to be with us, to carry our prayers before your throne, and to comfort us with your goodness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Please take a minute to silently read uh, this little introduction to the prophet Habakkuk. Listen to God's word. The prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted.
Will you pray aloud with me? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me.
Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, says the Lord. Amen. I would just welcome you again, especially if you're visiting with us, if it's your first time here, we'd love to get the chance to meet you. Uh, When I say we, I mean all of us, anybody around you would love to get the chance to meet you, so uh, we hope you stick around a little bit afterwards to say hey to some folks. Um, Announcements wise, you should check the back of your bulletin. There's several things uh, coming up in the life of the church, so be sure to look at those. I just want to mention, though, that uh, Reverend Matt Bowling will be opening God's Word for us this morning and preaching for us. Matt is a member of our presbytery. He's pastored several PCA churches. He now serves uh, full-time as a church consultant, and he's in town this weekend meeting with All Saints Session and talking about some planning things. And so we're grateful to have him here, and I'm looking forward to uh, having him preach for us this morning. Um, We'll now uh, go to Lord in prayer. Evan Heinemann is going to be leading us in prayer this morning. Evan's a senior at Boise State. Um, He's been involved with RUF since he was a freshman at Boise State. He's been involved here at All Saints since then as well. So thanks for praying for us, Evan. Good morning. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the invitation that you give us to come before you and to cry out to you, how long? We thank you that you see and know every suffering, every tear, every struggle, every longing. You are kind and compassionate, Father, and a faithful and loving Savior, and yet we ache for your redemption to be fully realized in our present experience. And so we ask, how long, O Lord? How long will our struggle with sin continue? How long will we endure sorrow and mourning? How long will your church around the world suffer for your name's sake? How long will injustice and oppression remain? How long will people continue to hurt one another? How long will we be lonely and anxious, afraid, depressed, angry, impatient, and unfaithful? How long will we be tempted to forget you and run after false gods? How long until you wipe away every tear? How long until death is no more? We thank you for the gift of your spirit who assures us that we are your children and who intercedes on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, for it is in your name that we pray. Amen. Uh, Well, now, uh, this is a part of our worship. Uh, We give to the Lord a portion of all that he's given to us. We'll sing together, uh, give thanks with a grateful heart as we take up the offering this morning.
This part of the worship service is not an intermission or a break. This is actually part of our worship as we greet one another with the peace of Christ. So will you stand and greet those around you? It's a great privilege to be with you this morning. Um, It's uh, been my privilege to be involved um, behind the scenes a bit with All Saints over the years and to now have the privilege to be able to come and to bring God's Word to all of you uh, that I have prayed for. Uh, Your senior pastor and I have been friends for many years, and um, it's a privilege. We're going to look this morning... um, at some of uh, the words that God gives us in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and then into the first part of chapter 4. Uh, you'll find it written there uh, in your bulletin, and so let me read this and then I'll pray. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death, or the present, or the future, say it with me, all are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then... Each one will receive his commendation from God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Father, it is most common for us to root our identity in something. In something that's made, something that we've made most of the time, something we are, something that we've done, something that we're not, and yet all of that is frail. It crushes in our hands. And you offer us something so wonderfully better than that. Would you give us a taste of that as we hear your servant, Paul's testimony? And would you lead us towards it? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm uh, Hamilton, not the musical. Did that come to Boise? Did you hear about that here? Um. There's a lot I could say about Hamilton. I would say, um, it it was interestingly enough, it was our Presbytery clerk that put me onto Hamilton. He sent me a text one night and said, "You should buy Hamilton." And I don't buy music. That's not really me. But for some bizarre reason, I listened to what he said, 
And the Lord opened up my heart in a way that was completely surprising. Through a play, a musical written by a pagan. Hamilton is interesting for a number of different reasons. Um, the inner psychology of the main characters is fascinating to me. The way that they think about themselves and they process the lives that they've had and the lives that they're living in. What animates them, what drives them, what fears they have. It's fascinating. Alexander Hamilton, there's three words uh, that are collected by Lin-Manuel Miranda based on the biography by Ron Chernow. There's three words that go all through the entire musical. Bastard, orphan, immigrant. Bastard, orphan, immigrant. He's haunted by those three words that say to him who he is and who he's not. Let three words run through your mind in a similar way. Words that were said by uh, a parent, a relative, a sibling, a friend who ghosted you. The words you say to yourself, that you call yourself, that you name yourself. For Hamilton, bastard, orphan, immigrant is what he wanted to run away from. Which is why it was so attractive, using another line from the play, that in New York, you can be a new man. Hear the depth of that. In New York, you can be a new man. You can leave behind that lousy identity that you had and you can make yourself to be somebody brand new. Now, none of you students who came from rural areas to Boise wanted to find something new here in the city, right? Hamilton's um, fascinating. If you get the chance to read the big biography, you should. Uh, he had prodigious achievements. The whole of Western banking is based on what Hamilton created from scratch. Coast Guard, the New York Post, you could go on and on. But you'd be mistaken if you thought that his achievements were his goal. They were not. They were a means to an end. They were a way to get from here, from, from bastard or from immigrant to there, which is some stable sense of who I am that I can live with. That's what he was really after. And without a firm identity in Christ, you might go after achievements. You might go after sin. You might keep from certain things. Trying to show yourself to be righteous, different. If you know the story of Hamilton's life, you'll know that he fell into a lot of sin. He was a person just like us, just like you and me. But he fell into a lot of sin because he was trying to find an identity. And you and I have no idea what we're capable of as we work for an identity. I want you to remember that phrase. I'm going to come back to it. Work for an identity. That's what Hamilton was doing. My, uh, Brian accurately put that part of what I do is I come and I, I help churches. And one of the things um, that is axiomatic of people who do what I do is that a healthy church has healthy congregants. Pretty easy. What's a healthy congregant? A healthy congregant is one who has a firm identity in Christ that serves as the foundation of life and relationships and ministry. A healthy congregant is one who has a firm identity in Christ that serves as the foundation of life and relationships and ministry. 
Identity in Christ, building identity in Christ, is the consuming goal of the Apostle Paul. If you look at all of Paul's letters, they follow the same pattern. Y'all are messed up. I know how you're messed up. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to preach the gospel again to you so that you'll understand the gospel and facets of the gospel in the way that you need in light of how you're messed up. So I'm going to re-preach the gospel to you. I'm going to build up your identity in Christ, and then I'm going to tell you, you don't have to live that way anymore because of what you already have in Jesus. Building identity in Christ is the consuming goal of the Apostle Paul. It's, it's what, identity in Christ is what underlies the inner psychology of Paul. An inner psychology that is so different than Alexander Hamilton's that you wonder if they're even the same species. Well, how do we know Paul's inner psychology? Well, he tells us. He tells us what his inner psychology is. He tells us what his internal narrative is like. What he speaks to himself. He tells us. And God gives us that for our good. And so that's why we're going to look at this text today. Uh, This text, interestingly, works well from bottom to top. And so we're going to go first down to verse 5 of chapter 4, where we're going to find uh, the problem. If you're a note taker... Um, We're going to, it's a three-point sermon. I'm a Presbyterian pastor. Come on. It's a three-point sermon. uh, And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to see creaturely judgment as the problem. Uh, Some of you, if you have read uh, the little um, kind of expanded sermon by Tim Keller called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. If you haven't read it, you ought to read it. Every single one of you. And I mean that. The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. You will find some parallels between what I say and that. Uh, sermon because my life has been marked so much by it. Well, what's the problem? The problem is creaturely judgment. Look with me down at verse 5 in your text. There God, through Paul, says, Therefore, do not pronounce judgments. Now, we have to take this carefully. You look at Paul's letters, he confronts a lot. So this isn't just kind of let, well, see, be. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, um, there's a difference between what you can see and what you can't see. This is about judging motives, hearts, character. And notice that it's pronouncing judgment before the time. There will be a time when it's going to happen, when, when scarily all things will be revealed. The word here is that you do not pronounce judgment before the time Well, what's that time? It's before the Lord comes, when he comes back, when all things are put right. Then the Lord will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and he will disclose the purposes of the heart. We don't do that. We we can't disclose purposes of the heart. We think we can, but we can't. But the Lord will. And when the Lord returns, then, Now, these next two words are extraordinarily important, important enough to to pause. Then, each one, I'm going to pull my phone out and look up a text. If you have a regular Bible, not just the text that's in there, I want you to turn with me to the book of Revelation. And I want you to go to chapter 2 and see if I wrote it right in my notes. Yeah. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. This is amongst the letters to the churches, which are fascinating all on their own. But I want you to hear something here. Revelation 2, 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, the one who sticks with Jesus, the one who keeps believing the gospel and living in light of it. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. Now listen to this. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. I want you to feel the depth of that. I asked you a little bit earlier to think about 
three words that have been spoken over you, three identity words. Do you know what this says? This says God has a pet name for you. God has a pet name for you. A name that is only between him and you. That's how individually God relates to us. He counts up the pain and none is missed. He relates one to one with each one of his children. Enough that he has a pet name for you. That's what this says. That each one, to go back to 1 Corinthians, each one will receive his commendation from God. Now, why is this important? Much of what we do as we're working for an identity is trying to get the commendation now. Commendation for me, commendation from you. We want it now. Thank you very much. But we must be content to not seek it now. Not commendation from ourselves, not commendation from others. Encourage others for sure. Paul does a bunch of that. But there's a waiting. It's a good waiting. It's a waiting that's worth it. When the Lord comes back, each one will receive his commendation from God. But we're impatient. We feel this compulsiveness to build an identity all by ourselves now and to work for one. And one of our tools as we build an identity is judgment. It's creaturely judgment. That's the distinction here that you're given, is the judgment of creatures versus the judgment of the creator. The one who knows all versus people who know really marvelously little. See, we don't have the ability to see the heart. So when we presume to judge, we proudly judge in darkness, assuming what we know what we couldn't possibly know. And so the command here is to not arrogate to ourselves God's prerogative to judge men's hearts. But this also revolves around ourselves, too. You see, pride works two ways. In pride, we can knock down others. We can critique them in our minds, in our hearts. And sometimes we can be foolish enough to do it with our words. And we can critique and judge and knock down people around us. Why? Because we're trying to feel okay about ourselves. And if I can knock you down, I can feel okay about me. Because you're lower. And that means I'm higher. But we can also puff ourselves up. We can judge ourselves worthy and deserving. We can commend ourselves before the time when God will make that ultimate evaluation. How do you avoid that? Well, let's move up in our text and take a second point, which is that you should not fall for self-justification. Look with me the second half uh, of verse 3, the very end there. He says, in fact, I do not even judge myself. I wish I could say that about me. I am a constant critic of myself. It's horrible. It's not a way I would like to live. But it is a way that I live. But I don't want it. Because it's horrible. Paul says, I don't even judge myself. I don't judge myself superior I'm not self-aggrandizing, but he also doesn't lower himself too much, but appropriately. We go on in verse 4, for I'm not aware of anything against myself. Now, that's not Paul saying that I don't think I'm a sinner, because other places he says, I'm the chief of sinners, the apostle, chief of sinners. But shouldn't we all be able to say that? So what is he saying? I'm not aware of anything against myself. I think the idea of what I think he's trying to say is that I'm repentant and I'm reconciled. I'm repentant of the sin that I know of and I'm asking the Holy Spirit to show me my sin. I'm assuming you do that, right? Ask the Holy Spirit, show me my sin. 
and repent of it. That's why we do confession services. But that's every day for the Christian. It's a lifestyle of repentance and faith. Paul says, I'm repentant and I'm reconciled. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. I think he knew he had hidden faults. He wasn't self-justifying. He says, it is the Lord who judges me. He committed himself wholly to the Lord. He put himself in the Lord's hands. Paul refused to be a determiner of his own righteousness, his own acquitting. In the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, first question and answer, he put himself into the hands of his faithful Savior. Have you done that? Put yourself in the hands of your faithful Savior. Now, you might hesitate to do that. Maybe you're still exploring Christianity. This is new kinds of things to think about, that's good. I'm glad you're here to hear this and to see that this Bible that Christians believe touches down in the very recesses of our heart, the things that we struggle with day by day. That's why a text like this is so important. Now, you might struggle. You might wonder, can I, can I trust if I put myself in the hands of Jesus that that, that will be okay? And it might be hard to do that unless you understand that Jesus solves both of our main problems. See, human beings have two problems before God. God has said, do these things, and we've we've said, hmm, maybe, and maybe not. And he said, don't do these things, and we've gone, hmm, but I like some of those things, so I think I'll do some of those. And that produces two problems, right? We're supposed to have done all these things that God has said to do, and we haven't. And there's all these things that God has said don't do, and, well, we've done some of them, and we've blown it. And Jesus comes along, and in our place, he lives a perfect life. Do you ever wonder why Jesus just didn't die as a baby? And it's just, if it's just about his death on the cross and resurrection, he could have died as a baby. But he doesn't. He lives a full life. He grows up through childhood. He grows up through adolescence. He grows up uh, as a young person with siblings and parents and um, making his way in the world and being around real people and facing all of the stress and struggles that you do. And he did it perfectly without ever once sinning and doing everything that his father asked him to do. And he did it because he was righteous, but he was there doing it for you. So that before the Father, you could have the record of Jesus' righteousness. Then instead of my stinky record and your stinky record, what you have is the record of Jesus. As though you had never sinned and as though you had done perfectly everything that God expected of you. So Jesus comes and lives perfectly in your place. And then he dies. And he dies taking the punishment for sin. But not sin he did. Sin I did. Sin you did. Sin we did. And he dies bearing the wrath that God righteously has towards sin. And thus towards sinners. And all that wrath is poured out, it's exhausted on Jesus to where there's no more wrath for those who will hide themselves in Jesus and say, I need your record, I need your death. I turn from my own ways of trying to live and save myself and somehow create an identity for myself. And I hide myself in you. I entrust myself to you. I place myself into your hands, faithful Savior Jesus. That's what Paul's saying is, He did. Have you? You should. Maybe you've lived for a Christian for a long time and you're kind of like, I'm so glad you did that part, preacher. 
Heard that a million times. Thanks. Remember that these are the words of the Apostle Paul, who planted churches and wrote inspired letters, who lived the struggling life of the believer. And he was telling you what it was like for him. That this was the pattern of his repentance and faith daily lifestyle. He's telling you what that is. Paul says, I reject self-justification for justification through Jesus. When you judge yourself or others, what you're doing is you're, you're chucking out justification through Jesus. And you're saying, oh, I can get this done. But it's a trap because you know you can't, even though you try. What God's trying to say is, hey, reject that. You reject self-justification when you throw yourself anew on God's mercy each day. And when you do that, you can then third feel the freedom of identity in Christ. Let's look at the first um, couple of verses of chapter 4. Remember the context here, and you get this from what we read earlier up in chapter 3. The context in Corinthians, if you've read this in 1 Corinthians, is uh, both... um, uh, Paul and Apollos and Cephas, they'd all had a role. They'd all been preachers like me that had come through. And different people had allied themselves and said, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas. Now, why do we do that? I should have worn a Boise State t-shirt. Why do we do that? I'm of Boise State. It's an identity. We ally ourselves to something because we think in so doing or someone. We think in so doing, a political party, a a figure, a preacher, a church, that we think that somehow if we ally ourselves to something that we we can receive from that some stable sense of who we are. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. And Paul comes along and he goes, eh, You're thinking about this all wrong. Let me tell you how you should think about this. This is how you should regard us. Verse 1, chapter 4. The apostles, what are we? We're servants of Christ. Servants of Christ. Stewards of the mysteries of God, of the gospel, and other now revealed mysteries that we have in the New Testament that speak of Christ. That's who we are. We're servants of Christ, stewards of the mystery of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. That's what Paul's endeavor was, was to be trustworthy with these gospel mysteries that he'd been given. Paul comes in verse 3, and he begins, he says, this is how I think about myself and how you should think of it. This is how I think about myself, and this is how you should think about me. And let me tell you what I think about you. Let me tell you what I think about you. It's a very small thing. It's a very small thing. That I be judged by you. That's an amazing phrase. I wish I could say that. I wish I could say that this morning. It's a very small thing. This is hopeful. This is hopeful. This is Paul being honest. This is gospel-saturated Paul. This is Paul full of identity in Christ saying, although it could be tempting to me to try and get an identity from you being allied to me as an individual, That's all wrong. That's all messed up. In fact, for me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you. And really, by any human court. That this word, every time you preach a sermon, I've preached a sermon several times, different things stand out to you, and at least this morning, 
that phrase human court fascinated me. How is it that you go into a setting, you go into a classroom, you go into a, a meeting, you go into a church service, and it's all, you're always in court? You're always trying to find out, am I okay? What's the judgment? What's the judgment of me? What's the judgment of you, of me? We're always back in the courtroom. Paul goes, eh. You know what? It's a small thing. I'm not judged by you. I don't even judge myself. It's pretty corrosive, though, when you live in an environment where it's judgment all the time. Judgment always reveals that the judger does not have a firm identity in Christ and that they feel a great need to pass judgment on others to feel okay about themselves. Paul says, I'm free of that. I don't need that. How? He had a different identity. An identity that wasn't built on his evaluation of himself or your evaluation of him, of me. That wasn't the way that he thought about it. What was his identity? Servants of Christ, stewards of the gospel mysteries of God. Notice how those identities that Paul speaks don't revolve around him. If you were to take these words, for example, over yourself. Not the words that have been spoken over you. But these words. Notice how these identity words don't revolve around me. They don't revolve around what I've done. They don't revolve around what you think of me. They revolve around Christ. They revolve around what Christ has done. And that the main thing is that I've been found in him. That I'm drawing identity from him. Now, for some of you, you still have hope. You still have hope that somehow the judgment you have of yourself will be enough. Or the judgment that other people would have of you would be enough. I pastored for some years um, in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, which no one's ever heard of. It's about 45 minutes due east of Pittsburgh. And on the main drag, small town, county seat, 35,000 people. On the main drag, where the little shops always are, in the little town. There was a shop with an honest sign. With an honest name. It was a, I grew up Jewish in New York. What, you can't hear the accent? It was a tchotchke shop. And the name of the shop was never enough. A shop with a true name. But isn't that everywhere? It's never enough. Now, if you still have hope in what you think of yourself or what other people think of you, to hear what I'm saying this morning isn't very reassuring to your self-esteem. It's not to mine. There's things that I'd like to receive the judgment from people that, well, that was a great sermon. Please don't say that. It's the most corrosive thing to a pastor's heart. He doesn't need that. I don't need that. Most of us would like to be known for something, to build an identity around something. Now, I said I'd come back to this phrase, working for an identity. And I want to contrast that. Some years ago, I want to contrast that with something else that I'll call receiving an identity. Some years ago, God helped clarify for me the difference between working for an identity and receiving an identity. Here's what working for an identity looks like. It looks like what Alexander Hamilton did with his whole life. It means that somehow all that I am doing, all that I am about is somehow trying to get a verdict in the court of humans that I'm okay. That's working for an identity. It's what Hamilton did with his whole life. You know what it does? It puts me on a treadmill, a performance treadmill. It puts those around me on a treadmill. 
because somehow they have to affirm the judgment that I have of myself, or I have to receive from them what I don't find in myself. And so I seek it out. Come to me with your good judgment of me. Hair, clothes, performance. There's numerous ways to work for an identity. It's what most humans are doing most of the time. And it's death. It leads to untold stress, fear, anxiety, worry, and lots of other sins, as Alexander Hamilton found out. What's that contrasted with? What if what the gospel says to me is that if I simply receive with an open hand by faith what God grants me for Christ's sake, that I receive an identity? A stable sense of self that is fixed, unmoving, unchanging, because the verdict has already been rendered. Court's already out of session. The judgment has already been acquitted and righteous for Christ's sake. Friends, that's the stable place. And it makes life vastly simpler if I will simply choose day by day to receive an identity. Child of God. Child of God. Adopted in love. Those are the words you need to speak over yourself. Not those crappy ones from the beginning of the sermon. Those words. Can you wake up in the morning? This is a great exercise, by the way. Wake up in the morning, flip over on your back, and begin to pray. And say, Father, I believe that I am loved by you. Can you say that? Honestly? Really? Truly? That you are loved by God. And that that is the word that you speak over your day. That I'm received for Christ's sake. That I'm righteous in your sight. That you have a name for me. You relate to me like that. That's a beautiful life, friends. The reason I had us read the end of chapter 3 you look at that in your order of worship. Look at verse 21. So let no one boast in men. That's what they were doing, right? I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. We're boasting in men. Trying to get an identity. Drafting off an identity like NASCAR's do, right? Drafting off an identity. If I'm identified with this person, then I have an identity through them vicariously. So let no one boast in men. Well, how is it possible that you don't do that? That you don't end up back in the human court of judgment, yours or others. And Paul says, say it with me out loud, for all things. Oh, come on. I said say it out loud. Try it again. Look at the text. You ready? Okay. All right. You ready? Okay. For all things are yours. Now, what if over every day you said to yourself, regarding identity, All things are already mine. They're already mine. I already have it. I don't have to find it in myself or suck it out of other people. I've already got it. That's what Paul says. He says, all things are already yours. All that you want in terms of identity, it's already yours by virtue of being united by faith to Christ. It's kind of like working your whole life The inverse of this is kind of like working your whole life to have enough funds to retire only to discover that when you check your balance that you were already a billionaire. You worked the whole time, but you didn't need to. That's what Paul's saying. But of course, we're talking about something vastly more important than money. We're talking about having a stable sense of self so that you're not canvassing about internally or externally for it. Now, why is this great? You're free. You're free. 
Imagine a life where you aren't consumed by self-justifying thoughts, inward pep talks to maintain a sense of self-respect, or seeking out what others think of you. Imagine a life like that. When that chatter diminishes because of an act of faith in Christ that frees you to follow God, to follow his commands. A free people. Free people make a great church. God's design in sending his son for us is freedom. It's for freedom he's won us by the work of his son in our place. What do you hear when you come to this table? Do you hear your father say, don't you see here my heart for you, that I'm for you, that freedom is my design for you? Do you hear your father say, can't you see that this is why I sent my son to be broken and his blood poured out so you could be free in him? Won't you embrace that kind of freedom Freedom that comes from having a firm identity in Christ. Won't you enjoy God for giving that to you freely because of Christ? Won't you? Won't you feel the freedom of identity in Christ? Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you love us despite us. That that's precisely what we need that you see our plight and you answer our need. And you do it in the most incredible way, the most difficult way, the most costly way to demonstrate your love towards us. You give up your only son that we might be found in him. And having been found in him, being loved, that we would walk free. Oh, would you grant this to us? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, friends, I say the Lord be with you. With your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He took upon himself the weight of our sin and carried the burden of our guilt. He shared our life in every way, and though Tempted was sinless to the end. Baptized as your own, he went willingly to his death and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by his blood. Our Savior gave this holy sacrament and commanded us to continue it until he comes again. We eat and drink in faith eager for his reappearing. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Yes, as you see written here, the, uh, the Lord's Supper is the family meal for us as Christians. We invite all baptized followers of Jesus who acknowledge their sins against God and their neighbors and confess their need for the grace of Christ to participate in this meal. Um, if you've never been baptized before, I'd love to have the opportunity to get to do that. Um, and if, if you're not a believer and you're, you're not a Christian, um, we would love for you to, you know, to obviously to gain the identity that was spoken about today. I mean, imagine a life where you're not trying to justify your own existence. Um, imagine a life where you live um, 
as an adopted son and daughter uh, around the family table. While they were eating, we read in Matthew 26, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body.
brothers and sisters, all we have is Christ, and hopefully you made the connection. That, that is why all things are yours. All we have is Christ, and therefore all things are yours. Take and eat. And then following the supper, he took the cup, he, he gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. As Brian mentioned at the beginning of the service, throughout the season of Lent, uh, we're going to be following this pattern in our worship. Uh, it's a, we've entitled it Trumpets, Tears, and Ashes, um, very similar to how Israel came um, Often into her worship time with the sounding of trumpets that reminded them of the trumpets and the greatness of God on Mount Sinai and his kingship and his majesty. And so all of our, our services uh, in Lent will begin that way with you know, a celebration of the, of the triumph and kingship of Jesus Christ. Um, but, you know, there, there's so much that was wrong with Israel and there's so much wrong in the world and so much wrong in the, in the church today. Uh, and, and so, yeah, we will, you know, continue with the uh, series or through Habakkuk. Um, all that to say, there is a lot wrong in, in the church this week. Uh, um, I don't know if you heard the news, but uh, Kathy Shaner's sister uh, who had been battling cancer for a long time, she passed away this week. And then Susan Hendrick, our a dear saint whom we love, she passed away this week. Um, my wife's aunt passed away this week. It was just like one body blow after another of, of, um, of, of death. And um, so there have been many tears shed. And I, and I, I hope you will um, love on 
Kathy uh, and Rob Shaner and Dick Hendrick and the family and, and just express to them um, how, much, how much you care for them in, in this season of grief. Uh, we settled a memorial service date for Susan. We will celebrate her, uh, the grace of Christ in her life and, and anticipate her future resurrection on March the 20th at 2 o'clock at Covenant Presbyterian Church. So March 20th at, at 2 o'clock. Um, yeah. All right, would you please stand? service with an invitation from God to enter in, a call from him, and we go out with words, blessing over us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.